Okay. So we've been talking about configuration of flags and the problem with the flags, they don't look very geometric. I mean, uh, this is algebra eh? and um, people here, I mean, I think all of us, we like manifolds. Eh? So, um, so, so, which is what uh, I'm going to talk about today. And to some extent, the first four lectures were warm up for this. Eh? That's really what we care about, namely frame representations of surface groups. So I'm going to explain what that is. And so let, let's take a, a surface with punctures, with at least one puncture, and um, with a um, negative Euler characteristic. You know, once you have a punctured surface, there are not too many who do not have a negative Euler characteristic. So that's not a big restriction. Um, but so that guarantees that... Uh, your surface, you can decompose it into triangles like this, where you put the triangle, where you put the vertices at uh, the punctures, the holes, and so that's called an ideal triangulation because it does. Uh, it's the vertices are ideal; they sit at infinity of the surface. Okay, and so that begins to look a little bit like the polygons I had, the triangulated polygons. So we can put dots exactly like what we did before. And then we can even uh, have like stingrays and things like this. And so you, in each of these triangles, you put a copy of the discrete uh, tetrahedron, except, uh, so <clears throat> I've been stealing my pictures from another talk. Uh, so you can see that the, uh, the color, th I mean, already you saw that uh, before, you noticed that uh, my pictures used to be gray, and then the pictures that I drew specifically for these lectures on Mathematica, uh, they, they, they had a little bit of blue, and uh, okay, that's another source of pictures. So we uh, we put a copy of the discrete uh, uh, triangle. Here it's the case where n is equal to 6. And um, so it's a discrete triangle, but uh, you put the vertices in the holes. So actually, the vertices will not be there. And there are two types of dots, the ones that are on the interior, because they are the ones that, that, that are going to give us triple ratios. And then the ones that are on the edges, because they are the ones that are going to give us uh, double ratios, eh? the much simpler invariants. Okay, so if you have a picture like this, so it's on the surface. Um, it, my picture could have genius, except that if I don't know how to draw, to draw these kind of pictures on the surface with some kind of genius. It's really hard to see. So, uh, so you have to think that this might be a punctured sphere, for instance. Those I can draw. Hmm? But, I, I, but it could be a, a surface of genus too with, at least, with uh, several punctures. Just hard to draw. Okay, and then we can go to the universal cover. So in the universal cover, so before I go to universal cover, I had all these triangles. And so on the surface, I have finitely many triangles. But when I go to the universal cover, I, have, I can see infinitely many triangles. And each of these triangles carry dots, which is, again, hard to draw because uh, when the triangles get very small, the dots get very packed. So if they are very far, it's hard to draw. But the ones that are closer looks, look like the ones, uh, the pictures we had before. Okay. And so in particular, in this universal cover, we can take a very large disk, which is triangulated like that. And so if we take a very large disk, it looks like what we had before, polygons. I have a, uh, I have a triangulated po uh, polygon. Um, so except this, <laughs> on my picture, it doesn't look convex the way it looked in my previous pictures. But convex doesn't mean anything. This is purely topological. Eh? So, eh? so I have a very large polygon, and I have this triangulation of the polygon, and I have dots. And what, what I remember from uh, yesterday is that this gives me, um, if I put numbers on these dots, not non-zero numbers, 
I get I get flags that, that determine flags at the vertices of the polygon. So, so I try to do it. In this case, um, I put uh, 13 flags and then I got bored. Right? Um, and, mm. So you uh, given the, the dots and the large disk give me a family of flags. And then I can take the um, I can take the, the disk uh, sorry uh, did I, I, I so, sorry I, I'm too close to I don't see the uh, <laughs> yeah and then if you take the disk larger and larger then then you're going to get all the vertices of uh, in the universal cover so you're going to get a map which uh, to the vertices of the ideal triangulation of the, uh, of the universal cover uh, associ uh, associates a flag. So now you have infinitely many flags associated to the vertices at infinity of the universal cover. Yeah? Okay. Now, uh, in the universal cover, we have an action of the fundamental group. And uh, so this action respects the lift of the ideal triangulation. And so in particular, it sends a triangle, uh, an, element, uh, an element of the fundamental group sends a triangle like this one to a triangle like that one. And so here, this triangle has three vertices. If I look at their images, I get three vertices. And then by the machine, I get three flags. But here, the three flags have the triple ratios associated to these numbers. And the, um, that vertex, the three flags, have um, triple ratios associated to these dots here. Do something bad now. I'm speaking too loud. Eh? <laughs> OK. Um, and so, um, so by the classification of triple ratios that we saw, eh, they, uh, these two uh, triple, flag triples are equivalent by an action uh, by the, under the action of GLN, the linear group. And so I have I have an element uh, I have a linear isomorphism from Rn to Rn, sending the first flag to the first three flag triple to the second one. And so um, you, um, you do that for uh, all the elements of gamma, and that gives you a, a, a map for uh, an element of uh, GLN for um, every gamma. But this element is not unique, because when you have two, I didn't say it, but when you have two flag triples, if there exists a linear map sending one flag triple to the other one. If you rescale your linear map, it's still sending um, the, the tri flag triple to the flag triple. So in other words, the action of GLN on the set of flags factors through the projective linear group PGLN, which is the quotient of GLN by uh, the real multiples of the identity. Uh, I put multiplied here to mean uh, not zero. Eh? That's uh, that's the, the group of invertible elements of R. Uh, I didn't want to write R minus zero. Okay, so that's, P, that's PGLN, which is the correct group to consider here. Okay, so, we, and um, it's a group homomorphism for stupid reasons. I mean, you, you verify that it's well behaved with respect to composition. Ah, no, that's okay. That's okay. I know what to do. Okay, so the upshot is that if I give if I give myself non-zero weights on the dots, I so what I obtain is what I or more precisely Fock and Goncharov called a framed PGLN representation. So I'm going to use their terminology uh, for n equal two. I had been using something else called enhanced, but it's the same object. Right? Um, uh, um, and so that consists of a group. Homo so it's a pair consisting of a group homomorphism. And then 
a map from the space of vertices of the ideal triangulation in the universal cover to the space of flag. <laughs> and that map is rho equivariant. And uh, if you don't know what that means, that means that if I consider a vertex, I consider its image under an element of the fundamental group, and I consider the flag associated to that, it's the same as taking the flag associated to the vertex and applying rho of gamma. Rho of gamma, that's an element of PGLN, which acts on the set of flags. Eh? So that. So in other words, it sort of commute with the action of um, of pi one on uh, on st on the set of vertices and on the set of flags. Okay. Now, uh, the way I constructed it um, through triple ratios and, and double ratios guarantees that these map f has maximal span for the triangulation, which means that whenever I have a triangle of the triangulation, the corresponding uh, with vertices V1, V2, V3, the corresponding three flags, sat, uh, um, the, the corresponding flag triple satisfies the maximum span property. Well, that's by construction. Okay, and so, that, um, and uh, the machinery of double and triple ratios guarantees that they have a one-to-one -one correspondence between framed representation of pi one of s that have a maximal span for the triangulation, modulo the action of PGLN, and the space of uh, weight that I can put on the dot. Uh, uh, there is an explicit formula for the number of dots, eh, of course, but I didn't want to. I, I didn't want to put it on the slide. Okay, so there is nothing new here. And um, the problem with this, like uh, uh, in the configuration of flags, is that this definition here being maximal span for the triangulation is heavily depends on the triangulation. It's like... Um, Figuring out uh, which um, uh, which flags are max. I mean, we, we saw that that was true for flag quadruples already. Eh? That's the same phenomenon. Okay, and so that's really annoying if you want to if you're a geometer because you don't want things to depend on tri triangulation. For instance, if you want to see the action of the map, the modular, the modular group on uh, these kind of structures. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so we put and we need to put an extra condition. And now we know what we need to do. We want, uh, we, we want the representation to be positive. And what that means is that we want all the weights put on the dots to be positive. Eh? And uh, that is, uh, so again, the, the, this positivity property is, uh, is what you need to make the machinery work. And, a, uh, uh, and so I'm going to say that a frame PGLN representation is positive if it is associated to positive weights. And then we have the usual thing, which is that this is independent of the ideal triangulation. Namely, if you're positive for one ideal triangulation, you are positive for the other ideal triangulation. For, for that, you need to do two things. The first one is to make sense of that statement because originally, uh, where did I define? Uh, I, originally, I was talking about the vertices of the ideal triangulation of the universal cover. So you have to express that set of vertices in a different way. Namely, you have to describe them as lists of the functions of uh, the surface to uh, as, uh, to the universal cover. Well, so you need to work a little bit to make sense of that. I mean, it's, ah, it's standard topology, like you do, you can do ends uh, or something like that. Uh, um, and then w once you have that and you make sense of the statement, this is just the usual idea that because any, so you, um, 
it's again a classical fact that any two allele triangulation of the surface are related by a sequence of diagonal exchanges. And then we saw that diagonal exchanges respect the uh, positivity of weights and, and also respect the fact that everything is well defined. Right? That's the main thing. Yeah? So the, the whole theory is well defined under uh, diagonal exchanges. So everything works fine. And, uh, and so positivity is really a good tool to make, to make something that is well defined. Well, it turned out that it also create, um, guarantees that you have a very nice geometric or algebraic properties. So I'm going to select, I think, two are just, but uh, uh, so, the, so these positive framed uh, PGLN representations have nice properties. And uh, one is that if gamma, so if I take an element of the fundamental group and I look at its image under the representation, so then its image will be totally positive. Uh, so it's, it will be a totally positive matrix. Now, um, Totally positive, you know, it's a property of matrices. It's not invariant under conjugation. On the other hand, um, you know, when you take a closed curve, uh, things are only defined up to conjugation. So what I'm saying is that these, uh, the image is conjugate to a totally positive matrix. But then we're going to see in the next slide that there is a corollary which guarantees, which says that this is a nice property. Okay, so why is that? Let's take a, a closed curve and let's take a triangulation. And then, so the closed curve, you can make it cross the triangles of the triangulation and you can make it so that you do it without backtracking. Uh, don't hesitate, don't go whoop. And then, oops, 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 I want to go back. No, 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 let me go back. Oh, no. okay, don't do that. Eh? But so you go straight. And so we have this picture here, but then remember we have dots here and we have snakes. Eh? So every time you see, no, it's not when I close to the speaker that uh, I create some feedback. Hmm. Eh? No, it's just when I get excited, I think. <laughs> um, so, uh, unless, no, there is no, ah, there is a speaker here on the other hand. I, okay, in the center then. Okay, I'm using my finger then. <laughs> so, um, so every time you cross a triangle like this, well, what you see is that this is the triangle and um, there are snakes in here. And in particular, there was this bottom snake here. And that bottom snake gave me a preferred basis for the dual. Okay, so that's for this triangle. And then here, there is the, uh, the next triangle. And I have a bottom snake, except that um, I think I want to reverse the order, but okay, I have the bottom snake. I get another basis here. And, um, uh, and we saw that the, ch the change of basis matrix to go from one base to the other is lower uh, is upper uh, so in this case that was um, that, that was lower triangular positive right? we had an explicit formula and I told you I didn't check it we, we saw from the formula that it was lower triangular non-negative and I told you to accept that it was actually a triangular positive namely that uh, there were no zeros other than the, the ones below the diagonal Okay, so that guarantees. Uh, so, so then, uh, and then if you think about it, if you can, um, so as you go around uh, gamma, uh, then you're taking the composition. Now, what's a little tricky is that um, 
you're taking the composition, the order sometimes is a little funny. You have to be careful. You have to think really hard. Uh, so you think really hard, you do it, and then, oops, no, that was wrong. So you have to think harder. <laughs> and after two or three times, you get the, uh, you get the order right. right? Um, but um, it, it's fine. So you can express... Uh, rho of gamma, not as a composition of these triangular positive matrices, but as the dual, because these triangular positive matrices, they are in the dual. Yeah, so you have to take the dual map. But okay, so everything that was lower uh, triangular positive becomes upper triangular. But okay, no, no problem. Yeah? And so this is the proof that Rho of gamma up to conjugation, you can express it as a product of lower triangular, uh, of uh, upper and lower uh, triangular positive matrices. And in particular, if you take a loop that cannot be deformed to a puncture, namely does not go around the puncture, then, then necessarily at some point you're going to have um, and uh, I'm sorry, whether the matrix is upper or lower triangular depends whether the triangle points to the left or points to the right. And I would have to think a little bit of figuring out uh, how you go from one to the other. And so, uh, so in particular, if gamma does not just go around the function like this, then necessarily you're going to see a left-right at some point. And so you're going to have a product of a lower triangular positive matrix with an upper lower. And I told you when we talked about totally positive matrix that the product of these two is totally positive. Once it's totally positive, uh, you add more um, triangular positive. Uh, once you get non-zero because of the positivity, that stays non-zero. Eh? So, so, so that's how the product ends up being a totally positive matrix. On the other hand, if you go around the loop, well, you know, the, 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 triang the triangles go left, 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 left. So taking a product of triangular um, uh, matrices. So that's how you get that it's a triangle and it's a um, product of triangular positive matrices. So they say triangular positive and whether it's left or right depends whether you go clockwise or counterclockwise around the loop, uh, around the function. Okay. Now, what should we care? Eh? Uh, okay. Totally positive matrices. Uh, That's fine. I mean, it's, it's, it's a curiosity, right? But uh, the property, what we saw is that uh, a major property of, uh, of totally positive matrices is that they have real eigenvalues, which are positive and distinct. So you have exactly the same property here. Um, now, I'm lying a little bit because um, a matrix has eigenvalues. Uh, an element of a PGLN, a projective uh, map, does not eigenvalue. So you have to take ratios of eigenvalues. And then, um, I mean, for instance, uh, uh, and then you have to make sense of this, uh, see what that means here. I don't want to do it. Eh? It's a... Uh, It's technical and not important. Eh? So um, just it's the fact your, your matrix has real eigenvalues. You know, in general, a matrix has no, has no real eigenvalue. Eh? So, so here we get that. And even if you go around the closed loop, well, certainly you're not totally positive that you don't have that property. However, because you're taking a product of explicit lower uh, explicit triangular matrices, it's relatively easy for a product of uh, triangular matrices, it's relatively easy to find the eigenvalues, namely that's the entries on the diagonal. And so because you have an explicit computation, you can compute them and there is a nice, for, there, there, are, there, there is a nice formula to, I mean, I don't know if it's nice, but there is an explicit formula to compute this in terms of the double and the triple ratios, namely in terms of the numbers you put on the dots. Eh? 
Okay, that's one. Uh, so, so, so that's one practical uh, application of uh, these uh, positive representation. And that shows you that they are special. The other surprising one is that uh, the, the representation is discrete. Namely, it's is injective. Sorry, uh, the, the, I forgot the word injective as well. Yeah, so rho is injective, and it has discrete image in PGLN. And the idea, I'm not going to do anything formal, but here is the idea, is that totally positive matrices, when you keep multiplying, the, so the, um, being totally positive means that you're moving forward because you have positive numbers all the time in your basis. Yeah. So when you multiply, uh, when you multiply matrices, you keep the coefficients keep increasing because you're multiplying positive. You're taking, uh, I mean, the, the, you keep adding positive numbers. So if you keep adding p positive numbers, there is no way you can take a very long word in the fundamental group, and uh, whose image is very close to the identity. Uh, first of all, whose image is the identity? So that's uh, how you prove that it's injective, and but not even close to the identity. And actually, you have you even have estimates about the size of uh, the image of a word in the fundamental. Uh, when you, if you take an element in the fundamental group. You, uh, you you get an estimate about the size of its image under uh, the representation. So it's like a co convex co compact type of phenomenon. It's a, uh, yeah, so uh, that's uh, nice. Okay, so I focused on these two. There are many more nice properties. I don't want to have a, a complete list. And, um, um, and So Young wanted us to talk about uh, problems. I don't really have problems, but uh, mostly what I wanted to emphasize. So I'm, uh, I, I told you I'm, I'm going to finish early. Uh, we, I started late, but I'm going to finish early. So um, we just like to, I don't. I, I cannot give problems, but I want to just mention why this kind of mathematics is interesting. You know. For instance, I come from a different area of mathematics, right? uh, and I find myself dragged into it uh, because, uh, and, and I'm not alone. And actually, what the fun of these kind of things is that you have people coming from all kinds of different backgrounds, and then you can compare the viewpoints. So, in particular, the the big junction was with teaching representations, and uh, where you had two different points of view, com uh, three different points of view, the Fog Goncharov and uh, others point of view, which I talked about here, but also you had the Hitching point of view and Higgs bundles, and then the Labouri point of view who came with a much more dynamical approach to Anosov representations. I mean, I mentioned Guichard, Vinhard, I mean, there are many more people. Uh, uh, so very, um, and I mentioned those because this is the viewpoint where the connection uh, with uh, the positivity is more clear. Uh, it's um, the, these are more geometric. Uh, the Higgs bundle approach, uh, based on uh, complex uh, and uh, differential geometry. We keep saying, yeah, um, um, we're going to establish, we need to establish a bridge between these points, and it's not coming, let's face it. <laughs> it's really hard to, uh, to, to, to combine the two points of view. Whereas here, no, here, this is a natural uh, point of view. And, uh, um, and so with the various approaches, actually, you can broaden your perspective. Um, I should mention that, that because I was talking about PGLN, the projective space, uh, projective structures uh, uh, are certainly a very natural thing to consider. And uh, since we're here, uh, I, would, I have to mention the, the work of uh, Soyoung with uh, Bill Goldman. Uh, 
Uh, but um, many, uh, uh, and many more people, inclu including in Korea. But uh, the, uh, the the thing I didn't I, I didn't do in these talks is I wanted to be concrete and focus on GLN. But there are other groups for which you can do pretty much the same thing. So in particular, these ideas of positivity were developed by Lustig. And what you need for the Lustig point of view is a split algebraic group. Again, we go back to uh, that result of um, uh, Anne Whitney, uh, where uh, the group of totally, mo not the group, the monoid of totally positive um, matrices, you could split it as the upper triangular ones, the lower triangular ones, and the diagonal ones. And, um, and uh, so th that has a very the uh, theoretic uh, point of view. And, uh, well, so, if, so Lustig is the one who saw that you could do that in a much more uh, different framework. This is everywhere in the work of uh, Fock and Goncharov. Eh? Um, but there are challenges too, right? because I focused on these coordinates, for instance, uh, triple ratios and... Uh, it's much harder to see what would be the equivalent of uh, for uh, more general Lie groups. And um, it's probably hard. People have tried. Eh? Uh, but uh, perhaps, uh, um, I mean, um, people, uh, there are partial results, um, in particular for the sympathetic groups, I think. Gieson, you probably know this thing. Uh, okay. And what Evgeny, yes, uh, Ro Ro Rogoznikov, yeah, uh, and 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 I've seen other people do that, uh, yeah. So I mean, it's um, it's an interesting area, and also positivity has been relatively recently extended by Guichard and Vinhart to theta positivity, uh, which I. I don't know much about that except for the uh, uh, except for the name, but the idea is to really to understand what you need to do, uh, what is needed to make this machinery work, and uh, so uh, I think uh, it's also an adapt. And then uh, there is the connection with the whole world of cluster algebras and the so-called cluster ensembles, um, which uh, again, uh, I mean. Cluster ensembles were developed by Fock and Goncharov in this work. Right? Uh, so, uh, um, but, uh, but so that's a more. My point is that, for instance, uh, you have dynamical systems here, whereas this is much more combinatorial and Lie theoretic. And so these are interesting challenges to mix these two. In particular, one topic that is close to my heart is doing similar things for closed surfaces, which so far doesn't work that well because there is no construction that, uh, that I know that is um, map, uh, map, 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 mapping class group invariant. So that's the big flaw of uh, things that have been done so far. Okay, and then uh, there are all these problems about looking at uh, cusps and uh, convexities and uh, perhaps going to beyond surfaces. I said uh, in the spirit of what was in Tengren's talk. Uh, mm. Okay, and then another uh, part which is close to my heart is quantization. Um, so, uh, and it's qu quantization is probably something weird to uh, most people in this room except me, right? Uh, yeah, I, I always feel like a weirdo when I uh, when I talk about this. But so uh, um, you know, you have this theory of quantum invariance of knots and three manifolds, and quant which are based on quantum groups. And quantum groups, they are quote, deformations of Lie groups. Eh? Um, namely, that what happens when uh, you, you make the entries of uh, a Lie group, of a matrix, not commute anymore. And then um, you try to find... Uh, so, um, 
But what's great about this is that if you are in this room, you have a good geometric intuition. And the guys who do quantum groups usually, they have a good algebraic intuitions, but the geometry they don't understand. And so you can move there with your geometric intuition and try to do things that they didn't think of doing. <laughs> and uh, so, um, so, so the upshot is that, for instance, if what I was doing, you can replace PGLN with the quantum group UQ of PGLN. So that's what the algebraists are doing. But if you're a geometer, there is something much better, which is quantum PGLN, which is, uh, so technically it's the Hopf dual of UQ of PGLN. Um, so, so it's horrible the first time you see it from an algebraic point of view. It's a, it's a deformation of the co coordinate ring of uh, the Lie group. But actually, that thing is much more geometric. So for us here in this room, this is the correct point of view. And so you can do things. So um, I think, uh, so I had some work with Helen Wong for N equal two. And then, of course, it was a natural thing to, um, to, to go to the N equal N. And so there are lots of people here. And because we're in Korea, <laughs> <laughs> I would mention uh, one of the good ones working here is Yun Kyu Kim at Kias. Yeah, um, uh, I hope he's the only Korean working on that, that I'm not forgetting any other one. <laughs> but there are, uh, there are many more, and that includes uh, like my, uh, some, uh, some people who come a little bit from this area, like my student Dan Douglas, but also uh, cluster algebra people, like uh, Shapiro, the two Shapiros, uh, and, um, uh, and um, or uh, more uh, topologist, uh, topological people like Tangle and Adam Shikora. I mean, there is, you know, um, Helen and I, we, we make fun of one thing that we, ha we wrote that paper in 2011, and then we looked at the citation count for that paper. For 10 years, they got like two or three citations. Um, and um, usually that was us or a student, student of ours. And then suddenly five years ago, so two, three, and then uh, 10, ah, 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 15, 20, and now we are at 20. <laughs> It's partially due that uh, due to the fact that uh, there are a few people who started working on these things who are cranking out papers. <laughs> um, these things actually even work in dimension three now. So uh, there are the, these uh, two groups uh, doing um, things about three manifolds. Uh, uh, um, uh, and um, yeah, I'm predicting actually that uh, suddenly, uh, I'm predicting that our citation count is going to explode. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and listen, this is a list I could think about this morning as I was polishing this note, but uh, what's really important is this, and really what's important is actually that, so in these lectures, I gave a, I tried to give something that was very concrete, but very limited in scope and in space, and it was, uh, was supposed to be elementary, but there is this whole world out there. And so uh, students, you have a lot of things you can explore by looking at uh, what all the other people are doing, which is usually the way good mathematics is developed, by the way. Eh? So um, yeah, that's what the old guy is saying. <laughs> you young stars, you can develop the world. You can explore the world. Yeah. So I think I'm going to stop here. That's all.